Hi. Thank you for being brave enough to choose this video of uh, many people's least favourite topic in English, poetry. And in particular, the unseen poem exercises. And thank you for struggling along until video number seven, which is the last in this series of videos about the unseen poem and how to analyse it. Right. There's a lot to get through, so uh, let's press the button and see what's on the screen. A couple of arrows crawl reluctantly across, so we're looking at position and style, rhythm and rhyme, external references, and finish off with the unexpected. OK, first of all, position. A quick look at the importance of this topic with two examples from material we've looked at already. Here we're examining why a particular word or phrase is where it is, especially when it's there for emphasis. Let's just uh, do a little bit of uh, somersaulting on the position so there's room to have <coughs> the stuff up on the screen. Here we go. I think we've seen this before somewhere of man's first disobedience, etc, etc. The important thing here is the position of the word sing, because it gradually builds up over those five lines until sing hits you right between the eyes. And there it is. <clears throat> That's what I mean by the importance of position in style. Now, let's have another one which is not entirely unfamiliar to you. I'm not going to let you get away with this episode without seeing it at least once. This is the famous Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day. Now, what I'm emphasising are the last two lines. Both beginning with so long and both rhyming together. All the others are A-B, A-B rhymes. More about that in a, a minute or two. But that shows the emphasis put on those last two, two lines, the last couplet in the whole poem. Now then, do you remember episode one where we had a helicopter flying over a deserted island um, sharks in the sea and cruise ships on the horizon. I'm uh, going to come back to that now for a slightly different reason. If you look closely, you'll remember that there are two deck chairs parked there, side by side with books abandoned by their readers. One of them has been reading a novel, the other poetry. Remember, it was too far away to see the actual words, but there is an important difference that I noted between the two different kinds of text. And here they come. On the left, the poem, which has got a ragged right, and on the right, the text of a novel, the beginnings of Oliver Twist, which is right justified. The important point to note here is that the text of the novel does not have an even rhythm to it. Among other public buildings in a certain town, which for many reasons it would be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name, it boasts of one which is common to most towns, great and small, to wit, a workhouse whereas the poem has a very regular rhythm. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate, etc. That's the first point, which we will be looking at in a moment. Later on, we'll be looking at the second point, and that is there is no sense of uh, a rhyme in the prose, but in this piece of poetry, day, temperate, may, date, shines, dimmed, declines, untrimmed, there is a definite rhyming pattern, and we'll be looking at that in a few moments. First of all, then, the rhythm. And now we have a nice little 
scene here, which looks like uh, the set of Teletubbies, to those who know about these things. A rhythm divides the poem into what are known as feet. But you would think that the foot that we're talking about now, and here's the question being asked, and a rather unlovely foot trampling it, has got nothing to do with the human foot. In fact, it has, and that uh, the human foot, even though I'm setting fire to it now, tapping away in time to the music is the basis of rhythm. So let's look at a metrical foot which meters out the way in which a poem has a regular rhythm. A, a metrical foot consists of two or more syllables, usually a mix of stressed and unstressed, and here are the two most common. Both of them are something of a tongue twister. First, here comes the I am which looks like a misspelling of some little creature that should be bounding across this meadowland. The other is a mouthful called the trochi, which could, could well be a Scottish word for something unpleasant. Note that here the stressed syllable is the straight line and the unstressed syllable is the curved line. And that is how rhythmical patterns come together. So what we're going to do now, by the magic of the computer, is to move the iamb at the top and give you an example of the most famous and most commonly used pattern of this kind, the iambic pentameter. Pentameter means that there are five of them in a line. And iambic, as I've said, is unstressed, stressed. Shall I compare the two a summer's day? It follows the normal patterns of English language, and that is why it's so popular, and that's why Shakespeare uses it to such great success. But sometimes it cannot fit quite to what he wants to express, and this means that the Iambic pentameter has grown a whole range of little variations. I'll give you perhaps the most famous of all. To be or not to be, that is the question. Did you notice that the second half of the line has the pattern of iambics twisted a little bit? In fact, it's a trochee for that is and that enables the that to have all the emphasis. To be or not to be. That is the question. Right. Up to number two, up comes number two. The trochi. There we go there. That looks rather elegant, doesn't it? Now, when you want a wigwam, you never see one at all. But all of a sudden, three come along together with a little cloud, which is rather neat. And the question here is, what on earth has this got to do with a croquis? You will soon find out. Let me quote these lines. By the shore of Gitchigumi, by the shining big sea water, at the doorway of his wigwam, in the pleasant summer morning, Hiawatha stood and waited. All the air was full of freshness, and all the earth was bright. I, I presume you don't want me to go on with this anymore. I find it extremely tiresome. It is the famous, notorious poem, Hiawatha, by Longfellow. And that is made of truckies, as we shall see now. Here he is at the doorway of his wigwam. Uh, this is an trochaic tetrameter, four in a line, not five, at the doorway of his wigwam. You may be asking yourself how this uh, tiresome rhythm, as I call it, 
uh, is quoted at all and how can, how can it be so popular? Well, there are two examples I'll quote you. One of them is from Macbeth by Shakespeare, The Witches, Double, Double, Toil and Trouble, Fire, Burn and Cauldron, Bubble. Used for emphasis, and that's why you'll find it in children's rhymes as well. So, we will abandon the tents and the trochaic tetrameter, and let everything slide gracefully off the screen, and turn now to rhyme. The first kind of rhyme that I want to talk about is no rhyme. Blank verse and free verse. Blank verse is the iambic pentameter without a rhyme at the end. And here is a very famous example. Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. And do note that topless uh, does, have it, does not have its primary modern meaning. It signifies very, very tall. And ilium, by the way, is an alternative form for Troy. This is Dr. Faustus seeing Helen of Troy. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul, see where it flies. Come, Helen, come, give me my soul again. Here will I dwell, for heaven is in these lips, and all is dross that is not Helena. No rhyme, blank verse. Next in line is free verse, a rhythmic pattern which is not regular, and Milton's Samson Agonistes, a verse play describing the struggles, that's why he's called Agonistes, of the biblical Samson. It contains lines of free verse, but it's mainly a modern phenomenon and easily recognised. Samson now is blind literally and metaphorically. It is the chorus speaking, a dramatic technique often used at the time, and the chorus is directing words to the chief uh, actors on the stage and to the audience. Thy soul, which men enjoying sight oft without cause complain, imprisoned now indeed in real darkness of the body dwells. Shut up from outward light to incorporate with gloomy night, for inward light, alas, puts forth no visual beam. Rhyme is as easy as A B. Now, here is an example from a writer called Felicia Hemans. Her work is much parodied, and you may well be sort of familiar with these lines. The boy stood on the burning deck, whence all but he had fled. The flame that lit the battle's wreck shone round him o'er the dead. And here comes a helpful little bar with AB, AB to underline the rhyme. And, of course, you're familiar with the parody. The boy stood on the burning deck, a string of sausages round his neck. Father, father, the little boy cried. The sausages are nearly fried. Now let's have a look at another parodied work. This one by a certain Donald Bathleen. Here the rhyme was different. It is called AABB for reasons which will become extremely apparent in a moment. And this is the verse. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder how, what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. And the, and the rhyme is AA star R. BB High Sky. All kinds of variations are obviously played on those. 
And the parody, of course, by Lewis Carroll. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. Up above the world you fly like a tea tray in the sky. OK, we've had a bit of fun with rhyme, and now we move on to a different topic, external references. These are references to aspects of life beyond the poem, which the original audience would be familiar with, but not necessarily known by a present-day reader. Here's just a handful of examples. First, technological changes in all aspects of light, from candlelight to gaslight to electric, for example, from horse and cart to the horseless carriage. Secondly, vocabulary changes. Words alter meaning over time. For example, you should now know the former meanings of rude and awful. Then, a duo of important items. Readers of past ages would be familiar with Greek and Latin and the culture they represent. And there's also the religious element, the gods of Greece and Rome and their stories. Weights and measures are up next. A hundred weight and a furlong, a stone and a peck, and so they go on. All the lovely old terms are way out of use. Everything is now out of ten, out of a hundred. It's all decimal, which takes us on neatly, segues to currency. From old money with pennies, shillings, half a crown, guineas and so forth, now the currencies are all decimalised. Different cultures cause uh, quite a few problems in external references. A poem could be about Asia, China, India, Japan, and contain references alien to us nowadays. And finally, I had mentioned this before, have I not? Some of the biggest changes in the way are in the way we get about. On the canals, then the railways, then the road, from horses to the horseless carriage. So that's external references. And finally, a great sigh of relief goes up. Finally, the unexpected. This is a tricky one. It is related to external references. And I use it to mean anything that brings you to a halt, wondering what on earth the text before you means. Looks like English, it walks like English, and therefore it can be, well, completely incomprehensible to you. Here's a handful of examples taken from poetry of a former age. Awful tree. Well, that sounds like a topiary failure, but in fact it is a reference to the awe-inspiring cross of Jesus. Next up, another Biblical reference. Rude manger. One you should know now. The simple animal trough where Jesus was born. Next up. Crystal spheres. The medieval view of the universe was that the earth was at the centre of all things and that the planets, etc. and the stars circled round it in concentric, transparent globes. The music of the spheres, as they scraped together, was not audible to ordinary humans. And then words that sort of changed their meaning quite a bit. A horrid clang. Horrid meant dreadful, not a child's slang word, and a clang had much more punch in those days than it does now. Next up is Tantalus, another of those Greek characters who had a terrible punishment. He was stuck in a pool of water with grapes hanging above him. When he reached up for the grapes, 
they retreated out of his grasp. When he reached down to the water to drink, that too sank out of the way. Not a fun life at all. And then Janus. I have to pronounce that fairly carefully. If you think of, um, oh, I don't know, the English word janitor, you can see that there's a link here. Janus is the two-headed god of doorways, looking back and forward. Hence, January is the gateway to the year. Things that readers of an earlier age might be expected to know, but not us nowadays. Here's one that really sort of causes head scratching. A rood of ground. That means a unit of measurement. And now a word which has a completely different meaning. Without a city wall. There is a green hill far away without a city wall. This is the east to him. And it means outside. Out with, if you like. Rather like the Scots, up with. And finally, here it's a reminder of the list of options I gave you all those videos away. Physical appearance, vocabulary, imagery, point of view, personalities and personification, the actions of the poems, the five senses plus a possible sixth, position and style, the importance of where things are as much as what they are, rhythm and rhyme, external references, the unexpected, and as for number 12, that's up to you to write up your conclusions in a lucid and meaningful way. And if you want any help on those, please see my book, my study guide, Making Sense of Essay Writing, and also the accompanying video presentation, which is going to be flagged up for you. And if you have been watching, and if you have been listening, thank you, and I hope this has helped you on your journey to understand poetry and particularly unnamed poems.